As was announced earlier, my name is Austin Westlake. I am the associate youth pastor serving under Kevin Brown, who is the executive youth pastor, and uh, he's the man. But uh, that is who I am. I am so glad to be here uh, speaking to you tonight. It is such an honor. I don't take it lightly. And I just want to say thank you to the main event core team. Main event core team, could you please just stand up wherever you're at? If you're on the main event core team, stand up. Give these people a hand because they, they bust their butts to make sure that this ministry runs smoothly. So thank you so much. I am uh, very grateful, and I love you all. It's been fun working with you this week. And I bring with me my beautiful fox of a wife, Lauren, sitting right there in the front row. I love her very, very much. She's always supportive of me. So glad to have you with me. I love you very much. Yeah, aw, that's, that's where you say, that's where you say, aw. I'm a pastor's kid. Many of you know that. If you don't know that, now you do. I am a pastor's child, which means that I spent a lot of time in church growing up. Like a lot, a lot of time. I sometimes think maybe I was born in a church and my parents took me to the hospital to take pictures just so they, you know, make me think that I was born in a hospital. But I have been in church a lot, got in trouble in church a lot, sat through many, many, many church services growing up and through the years, and I went off to college, and my college, we, uh, it was a Bible college, so we had chapel every day, not like three days a week, but like every single day, and then they expect you to go to church on the weekends, so I went to church a lot, I heard a lot of preachers, I heard a lot of bad preachers, but I heard a lot of good ones too, there's a lot of bad preachers out there, but there's also a lot of great preachers, and of every church service I've ever been in, Every single sermon I've ever heard, every time I've ever heard the gospel of Jesus preached, it never, ever, 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 ever gets old. See, the story of Jesus never gets mundane. The story of Jesus never gets boring. It never gets old. I never get tired of hearing about Jesus Christ. Because you see, the story of Jesus Christ, it's not just some story of history, but it's his story. And see, his story... Because he has a story, we have a chance. Our generation has a chance. We got a shot at being who we're supposed to be, being who we're called to be, who we were created to be, because Jesus happened. Because Jesus is happening. And tonight, I don't know who you came to hear about, but if you didn't come to hear about Jesus, you came to the wrong spot. When I preach, I'm going to preach about Jesus. And if somebody dragged you here, if you're a visitor and somebody dragged you into this place, turn to the person who dragged you here and thank them. Because they dragged you here because they care about your soul. They care about eternity and where you're going to spend it. They care about what's going to happen to you. They care about the divine destiny that God has for you. We're preaching about Jesus tonight. Turn with me, if you would, Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Does anybody know what month it is? No, no, no. It's January. It's January. You've seen those subway commercials. (laughs) It's January. If you haven't seen a subway commercial, let me fill you in. It's January because you can get any foot long for $5. Any foot long $5. $5. Jan, you any. I am a Subway fan. Anybody else like Subway? I really, really, really like Subway. I mean, you can't ask for much better than a, a foot long of meat, cheese, and bread and lettuce. What's more healthy than that, too? I think Jared really had like one Subway a week, and that's like all he ate the whole week. That's how he lost all that weight. Remember, Jared? It's a foot of meat and bread. It can't be that healthy. Somehow it worked, but I'm a Subway fan. I do like Subway. I don't hold anything against it because of Jared, but uh, thank you. Thank you. I like water too. I'm a Subway fan, and I frequent the Subway right over there on Independence Avenue. I go there a lot for lunch. Real classy joint, let me tell you. I go there quite a bit for lunch, um, five star, and I like it. 
Okay, I like to go up there when I'm really hungry and just pound down a foot long. Every now and then, you just need one. And I like them quite a bit. A few months ago, I was in there, and, well, I, I got there. I opened the door, and there was a dead guy laying in the doorway. Like, I, I'm just trying to get a sub. But I go in there, open the door. There's a dead dude laying in the doorway. I'm not kidding. It's not a joke. Open the door, and being very pastoral and spiritually mature and all of that that I am, I open the door. I said, hmm, step over the dude and get in line. <laughs> not kidding. I was hungry. Stepped over the dude, got in line. Some of you aren't laughing, but you want to laugh because secretly, you know, that's kind of funny. Stepped over the dude, got in line to get my sub. I'm standing there. You would think I would start to feel a little bit convicted. My hunger was pushing my conviction out of the way, and my curiosity began to build up. So instead of going and helping this apparently dead man, I pull my phone out. I'm in line waiting for my food. Have my phone. Snap a picture. of. I'm not kidding. I have the picture. If you want to see it, talk to me another time. Took a picture of the dude. It's like, yep, got it. Put it back in my pocket was waiting to get my food. All of a sudden, I realized, what are you doing? You're a pastor at a church that you can see from the window right there. And you just stepped, all of a sudden, every flannel graph story of the Good Samaritan passed in front of my head that I'd ever seen in Sunday school. I was like, you better go over there and do something about this. So I walk over to the dead guy on the ground. And I'm just looking around. No one's saying anything, and there's plenty of people there. Like, it's not just me. Some of them probably had to feel a little guilty, too, I hope. I go over to the dude, and I'm like, psst, buddy, hey, hey, champ, I don't know what you're doing here, but uh, I don't know if you're dead or what, but you got to get up, man. It's, you're in Subway. Like, this is a public pl- restaurant, man, like... You know, you're laying in the, on the floor in the doorway. This is kind of weird. I'm talking to him. All of a sudden, the manager pipes up and says something. First time the manager's spoken. I'll just leave him there. I said, you've got to be out of your mind. What in the world is wrong with you? You're the manager of this place, and there's a, there's a dead dude over here. She said, no, nah, I'll just leave him. He's just, he's passed out drunk. I was like, whew, great. That is great to know. So I'm like, that's, that's a relief. I thought he was dead. So I'm standing there. I'm like, hey. I start talking a little bit louder. Hey, hey, man, you got to get up. You know, I'm kind of smacking his leg and kicking his foot. I'm like, hey, you, you really got to get up. She said, ah, don't bother. He's not only passed out and drunk, but he's deaf too. I said, you got to be kidding me. I'm like, Lord, you've got to be joking. Of all the people that I would find when I go to Subway, I can't just find Jared sitting in there having a sub. i got to find a passed out deaf guy in the doorway. At this point, I'm like kicking him a little harder. Like, hey, hey, you got to move, man. Long story short, long story short, had to call the police, and it wasn't a very good thing. It's not a very exciting story, but it was just weird. But the thing is, is that the guy seemed to be dead. But he wasn't dead, he was just asleep. Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 18, says, While he was saying this, Jesus, while he was saying this, a ruler came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her, and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him, and so did his disciples. I struggle to get through this, And even read it because when we call on the name of the Lord, Jesus stops what he's doing. He stops what he's doing because he hears his child calling. I love that. Skipping down to verse 23. It says, when Jesus entered the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd, he said, go away. See, Jesus knew something here right away. He was smart. He told the flute players to go away. I've never really trusted flute players. I don't think Jesus did either. If you're a flute player, no offense. If there is a flute player in here, I really hope there's not. Don't take offense to this, but I've not had good experience with flute players. It started in 93, October, 93. There was a, uh, there was a TV show that used to come on. You might know, know this TV show or have seen it or heard of it. came on Fox. 
It was called Mighty Morphin Power Rangers for all my 90s kids out there. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. And in October 93, they introduced a new character, the Green Ranger. And the Green Ranger, that, the Green Ranger, he, he was a Power Ranger, but he fought the Power Rangers. Like, what in the world is up with that? He turned on him. Hater. He fought the Power Rangers, and see, the Green Ranger, his, his weapon of choice was a dagger. His weapon of choice was a dagger, but that dagger doubled as a flute. What kind of Power Ranger plays a flute? It, it, it has a sound. It's very, very, very familiar, and if you've ever heard it, you would know it. It goes something like this. I believe we have it. I need dragons for power! Come on! You remember that? If you ever watch Power Rangers, you remember that. Can we hit that one more time? I just gotta hear it. Music to my ears. I need dragons for power! Classic! That's one reason why I don't like flute players. Number two, two words. Mr. Tumness. <laughs> Mr. Tum... Man, that scene was weird. It got weird when Mr. Tumness, you know, in, in Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, he had that flute, and he played the little girl to sleep. That's weird, man. Tumness and... Between the Green Ranger and Tumness, they ruined flute players for all of us, evidently including Jesus. When Jesus entered the ruler's house, he saw the flute players in the noisy crowd. He said, go away, the girl is not dead but asleep. It just got real then, huh? But they laughed at him. This is Jesus. They laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand and she got up. News of this spread all throughout the region. She's not dead. She's just asleep. The dude wasn't dead. He was just passed out drunk and deaf. He was, he was asleep. And he happened to be deaf. But the girl, she wasn't dead. She was just asleep. And when I was reading this, when I was reading this, I was at my wife's family's house in California. And I just said to God, I said, God, I need to hear something from you because my spiritual life feels dead right now. I need to hear something from you because I feel like it's been too long since I've heard your voice. I feel like it's been too long since I've had a real encounter with you. I need to hear something from you. And I turned to this passage, and God spoke directly to me. He said, listen, you may feel as if your spiritual life is dead. Your spiritual life's not dead. You're just asleep right now, son. He said, you are just asleep. That struck me so directly. I knew that God had pointed me to this passage for a reason. You're not dead. You're just asleep. And the more I thought about it and prayed about it, God started to put a burden on my heart for my generation. He started to remind me that my generation is living as if they are dead. My generation is living as if they don't have any more life to live. Somebody want to try and tell me otherwise, look on social media. Who's causing all the trouble on Facebook and Instagram? My generation. Watch the news at night. Who's shooting people? Who's being shot? My generation. Young adults, it is our generation that is living life as if they are dead. But Jesus has news for us, and I got news for you tonight. Our generation is not dead. We're just asleep. But by the power of Jesus Christ, we are going to wake up. We're going to wake up. See, I think we've been sleeping for far too long. My generation has been in some kind of a deep sleep for far too long. Is there any nappers in the building? Any nappers? Anyone like to take a nap? I love to nap. I love it. Hallelujah. I start speaking in tongues. I love to nap. And when I was in high school, I didn't really like to nap because, see, in high school, I would have rather been adjusting my top eight friends on MySpace or something. Back in high school, MySpace, I'll be honest, I even had a black planet. Anyone have a black planet? Yeah. Hey, all my friends had black planets. I know I'm not black, but oh, hey, hey, I'm just saying, I'm just, hey, like Sir Mix-a-Lot said, even white boys got to shout, okay? I had a black planet. I had a black planet, okay? I'm sorry. But I didn't really like to nap because there were better things. There's, there were better things to do. I didn't want to waste my time. Got to college, I started to like my naps. See, because, 
basketball practice in the morning, class in the afternoon, so on and so forth. By the time you get out, you're ready for a nap. Then I graduated and got married. Now I really like naps. All my married people said amen. I like to nap. Best kind of naps, Sunday afternoon nap. Bam. Sunday afternoon nap, that is the spot. That's just the best. There's nothing better than a Sunday afternoon nap. Lee Church, stop by Chipotle, get a burrito that is the size of a bowling ball. By the time I eat the last bite, I'm struggling to make it up the stairs to my bed. But I'm going to make it, hallelujah, get into my bed and go to, out. Sunday afternoon nap. That's it. Perfect nap time for me is like an hour to an hour and a half. You know, everyone who takes a nap has like that perfect napping window. You know, you got to try and get within that window. For me, it's like an hour, hour and a half. See, if I sleep much longer than that, when I wake up, man, I don't even know what day it is. (laughs) If I sleep for very long outside the window, I don't know what day it is. This past Sunday, I slept way too long, okay? I, I, I overslept. I had something I was supposed to go to Sunday night. I didn't go. Overslept. I mean, when we sleep too long, we don't even know where we are when we wake up. Every now and then I wake up, I'm like, I'm married? I live in this house. Who in the world is in my bed? What is this girl doing? Oh, that's my wife. That's my wife. That's my... You sleep too long, you don't know what's going on. See, you sleep too long, it's much more difficult to wake up. The longer we sleep, the harder it is to be woken up. The longer we sleep, the harder it is to be cognizant of what's around us when we open our eyes. Our generation has been sleeping for far too long. And I'm a dreamer. I like to dream. The people who are around me a lot know I am a dreamer. Sometimes to a fault. Sometimes it gets annoying. Am I right? I'll bust in your office like, hey, I got an idea. We're going to do this, this, and this. And you're like, yeah, well, that's kind of impossible. Some of it, some of it isn't, but a lot of times, sometimes it, you know, it is. And he's got to like pull the reins, like settle down. Let's talk it through. Maybe we can do this. I'm a dreamer. My dad has to hear it too sometimes. Dad, we got to do this. We got to do this at the church and this and that. Relax. That, there's a lot more strings that need to be pulled for that to happen. It's, I'm a dreamer. Lauren has to hear about it day and night. So when I go home at night, she has to hear about my dreams too. I'm a dreamer. I like to dream. But here's the thing. When we sleep, the best we can do is dream. Dreams are good. I'm a dreamer. But while we're sleeping, the best we can do is dream. It's not until we're awake that we can start accomplishing the dreams that God has put on our heart. It's not until we're awake that we can start going out and doing the things that God has given us a passion for. It's not until we are awake that that stuff can happen. As long as we sleep, the best we can do is dream. I want to do more than dream. I want to do more than that. I want to accomplish the things that God has placed on my heart. I don't just want to dream. We're going to talk about a man tonight who woke up. I normally don't like to look at two different passages, but these passages are linked together, and God pointed me directly to it. I know that he did because the day after I read this passage, he directed me right to this passage. Done deal. This is from God. I'm confident of that. Turning now to Mark chapter 10, if you have your Bibles. Mark chapter 10. If you don't carry a Bible with you, you need to start bringing a Bible with you. The Bible is the most important thing that I carry. It is the living, breathing Word of God. It will change your life if you read it, I promise. It's the words of Jesus. Jesus is a life changer. He changes lives. That's what he does. He's a life changer. Mark chapter 10, starting in verse verse 46, said, Then they came to Jericho, as Jesus and his disciples Together with a large crowd were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. We may take that lightly. It may seem kind of trivial, That is some of the most profound verbiage ever used. Some of the most profound words in the history of mankind. Call him. Because when I read that, I'm reminded that Jesus has called us. 
When I read that, I'm reminded that Jesus is called somebody like me and somebody like you. When I read that, I remember that because of Jesus and because his word validates us, we can accomplish anything that he places in front of us. Those words mean everything. Call him. Verse 50, so they called him to the blind man. Cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and he came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. This is a man who woke up. And you might even say to me, that doesn't really make sense. I don't, I don't quite get it. How, how is this a dude who woke up? He received his sight, but what does that mean? See, the New Testament was written in Greek. As you know, probably if you've ever heard my grandpa preach, he, he dreams in Greek. The guy is nuts. New Testament was written in Greek. There's a word, there's a word in verse 49. That word that says, on your feet. When the disciples went and got this dude, they got Bartimaeus and told him, on your feet. The Greek word for that is igieri, or igierai, which means wake up. And it happens to be the exact same word or root word that was used back in Matthew chapter 9 when Jesus raised that girl. Jesus is calling for his people to wake up. This is a man who woke up. And even better than the fact that he woke up was the fact that he stayed awake. See, he stayed awake long enough to have an encounter with Jesus. My message tonight is wake up, he's calling you. Wake up, he's calling me. Wake up, he's calling us. I believe he's calling our generation to something great this year. And I want to be a part of it. I want to be awake for it. But here's the thing. I don't want it to just be a one night thing. I don't want to wake my generation up for a potty break and send them back to bed. I don't want to wake my generation up to get a Kleenex and blow their nose and send them back to bed. I don't want to wake my generation up to get a drink of water and send them back to bed. I want to wake my generation up long enough so that they can have an encounter with Jesus. Because an encounter with Jesus changes everything. Everything is changed when we meet Jesus. He changed my life. I know he can change your life. He changed some people's lives in here you wouldn't believe. Jesus is a life changer. But we got to stay awake long enough to have an encounter with him. We can't open our eyes for a second and, I was awake. Jesus didn't do anything. <sighs> no, 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 no. See, Jesus doesn't always give us the whole puzzle in one, one part. See, he gives us little pieces of the puzzle different times. So we got to stay awake long enough to receive the pieces to that puzzle, to receive the things he has for us to understand the call that he has placed on our lives, because there is a call. And as we look at Bartimaeus, he did some things. He did some things that I believe helped him stay awake. See, for him, it was more of an awake being cognizant of what's around you. For us, I think it's a spiritual awake of being spiritually cognizant of what is around us. He was awake, he was aware of what's around him, and there are some things he did that I think we must do. Not that we should do, I think we must do if we plan on staying awake long enough to hear the call of God. There are some things we must do. The first thing he did in verse 50, he threw his cloak aside. He threw his cloak aside. That seems simple. It doesn't seem like a big deal, but you see where he was at, that cloak was, that was part of what defined him. That was part of his identity. See, he was a beggar. He was a blind beggar, which means, as I said, he was sitting outside of Jericho, sitting on the side of the road, probably kept this cloak, or as some translations put it, a coat around him, protect him from the wind, protect him from people maybe walking by and (laughs) spitting on him, protect him maybe some animals from coming and taking food he has and whatnot. This was part of who he was. You go to the plaza, Go to the plaza. I worked on the plaza. You can almost always pick out which ones are homeless and begging. They sit in kind of the same place as they always do. A lot, a lot of them, they'll, they'll have the same, same type thing, 
day after day. I've seen them. I worked there for months. It was easy to pick them out. A lot of the same ones came around. See, that was part of his identity. People knew who he was. He had that cloak around him. But you see, when he heard that Jesus was calling him, when he heard that Jesus was calling him, he threw his cloak aside. What do we need to throw aside this year? See, I believe that if our generation is going to stay awake, we got to take off the things that used to define us and throw them aside. we got to take off the cloak of 2013 knowing that that's not going to be the cloak of 2014. We have to take it off understanding that what defined us last week doesn't have to define us this week or next week because God has a plan for us. He's calling us. He's chosen us. He is speaking to us. And we got to get rid of the person that we used to be before he called us. He threw his cloak aside. What do we need to throw aside this year? I firmly believe that 2014 is not supposed to be a repeat of 2013. See, 2013, maybe we didn't get the job we were hoping for. 2013, maybe we didn't meet the person that we thought we were going to meet. We didn't meet the person we thought was going to come into our lives and, and get married to us. and We didn't get the promotion. We didn't, we didn't meet the right people or go to the right places. Maybe finances weren't right and we couldn't go back to school. That does not have to define what 2014 looks like. Because God has a new plan. It's a new season. It's a new day. And it involves casting off the old just like Jesus did when he hung up on the cross. Throw the cloak aside. Throw your cloak aside. And not only that, verse 50 is just ridiculous. Because not only that, this dude got to his feet. It says he jumped to his feet. Bartimaeus jumped to his feet after throwing the cloak off. And maybe I'm reading into the passage a little bit. Maybe you might say a little bit too much, but I don't think so. Because I think we can assume Bartimaeus had human characteristics. He was just like us. And I think there was some significance in that split second when he dropped the cloak off to the side and jumped to his feet. There was significance because he was taking another step or move towards Jesus. He was doing something else out of faith. It was faith enough to take the cloak off. It took more faith to jump to his feet. It was very important that he jumped to his feet because, you see, had he stayed sitting down on that ground... Had he stayed on the ground, I believe that that cloak might have been a little bit of a temptation for him. See, when, if he would have stayed on the ground and, and not got up, not made another faith move, and no one came over to him and, and grabbed him and helped him find Jesus or encouraged him again to get up, he might have sat there for a minute and thought, where's my cloak? Where's my cloak at? I need my cloak. Where's my cloak? Give me my cloak. I need my cloak. I need my cloak. I don't want a cloak. I want my cloak. Where is my cloak? I got to get my cloak. Because he would have got nervous. Maybe Jesus kept walking. Maybe he's not here. I I can't lose that because what if he doesn't heal me? I need to keep this to wrap around myself. See, he needed to get to his feet. He needed to jump to his feet because he needed to create some separation between himself and that cloak. He needed to create some separation from the thing that used to define him. Because you see, until he created separation, that cloak would have always been a temptation. And I got a question for you. What do you need to separate yourself from that happened in 2013? What do you need to separate yourself from? What cloak do you not only need to cast off or throw to the side, but you need to separate yourself from? Because I can promise you this. If you don't create some separation, that cloak will always be a temptation. See, what happens when April of this year starts to look like April of last year? What happens when May, May going into summer, starts to seem like the same old song and dance? We still haven't met the person. We still haven't got the job. We still haven't got the raise. We still haven't got the open doors or the opportunities. All of a sudden, the things that we clung to and defined ourselves by last year are going to look awfully inviting this year. All of a sudden, the same people we used to call late at night because they were our go-to, we know they're going to pick up the phone. They're starting to sound real good right now because the right relationship hasn't come along. 
And if we don't create some separation, make some space and step away from those things, it's always going to be a temptation. I'm not saying don't call that person anymore. I'm saying delete their number. Get it out of your phone. I'm not saying don't stop by that person's house. Don't even go that way home. Go the other way home. Take the long way home. I'm not saying that you need to just be nice to people all the time. I'm saying don't even talk to that person at work that you know is going to cause some confrontation and bring some beef. Separation is the only thing that's going to end that temptation. See, my generation is famous or infamous because we're famous for getting ourselves out of situations, shaking off the shackles so we can dance. Hallelujah, we are good. We are golden. Next day, I want to put these back on. Man, these look good. Man, it looks good. It's like a food that gives you horrible diarrhea. You eat a food, you know good and well that food is... When you're sick, you're sitting there thinking, I'm never eating this again. I'm sweating. I'm, oh, no. Oh, Jesus, just get me through this. I just got to get through... Next week, oh, I'm down. Let's get that burger again. I am down. I am hungry. Girl, I'm trying to throw down tonight. Give me the burger. <laughs> you know better than that. You know you're going to be on the pop for like three hours, man. My generation's famous for that. We're good at getting out of stuff, but we're almost just as good at getting back into stuff. We got to create some separation. We got to jump to our feet. We got to make another move towards Jesus. We can't just take the cloak off and stay sitting. We got to get to our feet, main event, because we got to get to Jesus. And that's the next thing in verse 50. He came to Jesus. He came to Jesus. That's huge. Going to Jesus is everything. See, he not only threw off that cloak and threw it aside, not only got to his feet, but he found his way to Jesus. I don't know how he did it because guess what? He was still blind. Dude was still blind when he stood up. Dude was still blind when he tried to go find Jesus. He was desperate. He was absolutely desperate for an encounter with Jesus Christ. Absolutely desperate. I don't know how he got there. I don't know if somebody led him the Bible doesn't say. I don't know how he got over to Jesus. I don't know how he found him. If he kept yelling. If he just happened to hear him. Or, I don't know, if somebody led him or, or he crawled to him. We don't know. But somehow, after he got to his feet, he found Jesus. And I think it's interesting. I think it's very interesting that Jesus waited until he was face to face with him to heal him. You ever think about that? I think it's interesting. See, Jesus is bad. He's He's so bad that he's good. He's the only one who's this good. When I mean this good, he could have healed Bartimaeus without even thinking twice. He didn't even have to think twice and he could have healed him. He didn't even have to look his direction and he could have healed him. He knew what he was dealing with from afar. He knew what he was dealing with before he even woke up that morning. He's Jesus. He's that good. And he's the only one who's that good. He's the only one who's ever going to be that good. He's the best. He's a life changer. He's a life saver. He's Jesus. He, he could have healed him before. I don't know why he didn't. But I think I know why he didn't. I think I know why he waited to have an encounter with him. You see, he could have healed him that morning as soon as he woke up, but he wasn't awake yet, Bartimaeus. He wasn't awake. The disciples had to go wake him up, remember? He wasn't awake. And, and I think that Jesus... He didn't give Bartimaeus his breakthrough at that moment. He, he waited until he got to him because he wanted Bartimaeus to be awake through his breakthrough. He wanted Bartimaeus to be cognizant of his surroundings and what was going on. He wanted him to know, to know, to know that it was Jesus who healed him, that it was Jesus who called him, that it was Jesus who sent for him. He wanted him to know. And he also... He also wanted him to have a face-to-face -face encounter with him, even though he couldn't see Jesus yet. He still wanted him to have a face-to-face -face encounter before he healed him. And I think, for us, this year, Jesus wants us, main event, to be awake through our breakthrough. Because you see, 
The actual breakthrough didn't happen until he got to Jesus. But before that, he had to be woken up. And I don't think Jesus is going to make any moves until we're awake. My generation needs to wake up because Jesus is calling us. He wants us to get out of the bed and be awake through our breakthrough. Because you see, this year, the enemy wants it to be of your fallout, of your fallout. God wants it to be the year of your breakout, of your breakthrough. He's got a breakthrough for us this year. I'm so confident of that. The enemy wants this so badly, so badly. He wants 2014 to be the year of our screw up, but Jesus wants it to be the year of our wake up because he's calling us. He's got a plan for us. He's got places for us to go. We got to get to Jesus. We've got to get to Jesus. If I could have some keys, that would be great. My dad back in the 90s, was a pastor in a, at a church down in, in southwest Florida. We loved Florida. The beach was incredible. Let me just say that. It was amazing. We still vacation there sometimes. Awesome spot. He was a pastor at a church down there. And at this church, they had Saturday morning basketball for the men. We have that here every now and then, Saturday morning basketball. It was from like 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., I think, right? Saturday morning basketball. 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. on Saturdays. I don't know how often they had it, but I remember they had it. And I remember that they had it because every now and then, on a Saturday morning, I was not a morning person. I hated mornings. Hated it. I asked my parents. I said some very terrible things before 9 a.m. in my day. Not a morning person. But sometimes on Saturdays, if he was going to men's basketball, he would come to my room and he would knock on my door if it was closed, or he would just walk in and pat me and say, hey, psst, hey, hey, wake up, wake up. You and I are going to go to men's basketball. I want you to come with me, and then we're going to go to McDonald's and grab breakfast after that. Does that sound good? What? what? Yeah, it sounds great, Dad. It sounds great. And maybe I'd turn over and fall back to sleep, but a few minutes later, I was up and ready to go. Because it was men's basketball. I couldn't even play. I was just a kid. I wasn't going to get any play. I was running around being a kid watching them play. By the way, he had a jump shot. He had game. He could dunk. He could throw down. My dad was a baller. I just want to say that. And I used to watch him play on these Saturday. He was a baller. I used to watch him play on these Saturday mornings. And then we'd go get McDonald's breakfast. And I can take you to the very booth that we used to sit in when he would take me there. Two, two booths right across from each other. I know we would sit in one of those two every time. I could take you there to this day if it still exists. And it wasn't the McDonald's, it wasn't, it wasn't the basketball, but I was excited to get up on those Saturday mornings when he would come wake me up. I wouldn't trade those moments for the world. Sometimes I wish I could go back in time and, and do that again, have him wake me up and, and take me just to follow him, just to kind of shadow him. And knowing we would get our time together at McDonald's breakfast. I like McDonald's breakfast as a kid, I still do. I like it, but that wasn't even it. That wasn't it. It was the fact that my dad would come in and wake me up and want me to come follow him. It was the fact that he would come in on a Saturday morning and take the time to bring me with him because he wanted me to experience things with him. He wanted me to have conversations with him at that McDonald's. He wanted to spend time with me. He wanted to bring me along. He wanted to wake me up and bring me with him. Tonight, your father is trying to wake you up. Our father is trying to wake us up. And there's nothing, nothing in the world like when a father wakes up his child. Being the child. I don't know what it's like to be the father yet. I can't wait. But there's nothing like it. And regardless of your circumstances, regardless of how last year went, regardless of how people have told you this year is going to go, so let me just say, you're going to have some haters. You're going to have some flute players who are in that room laughing at you when you say, I am, I'm not dead, I'm just asleep. Jesus is going to raise something up inside. People will laugh. People will clown you. They'll make fun of you. They'll try and drag you down. You'll have some people who say, shut the heck up when you're yelling after Jesus. Hey, son of David, have mercy on me. When we yell after Jesus, people like to yell at us. Look, I don't care. I don't care what people say. I don't care what people say about me or about us. 
when I'm calling out to Jesus because he's my heavenly father. Change my life. He can change yours too. But it's having a father wake you up and bringing you with him. Because at the end of this passage, and this is just crazy. This is crazy. At the end of this passage, Jesus didn't say, come follow me. Jesus said, go. Jesus said, go. Your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. So have you ever noticed when Jesus calls us to go, it always means follow. When Jesus calls us to go, when he has a call for our lives, it, it always means follow him. Bartimaeus followed Jesus. Some people probably said he's never going to be anything. Blind man, beggar. Some people said the girl was dead. Her own father thought she was dead. But her heavenly father said, no, 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 no. She's not dead. She's just sleeping. She needs to be woken up. Our heavenly father's waking us up tonight. Wake up. He's calling you. He's calling me. He's calling us. He's calling us to do things this year we never thought we could do. He's calling us to do things this year we never imagined he would call us to. He's calling us to places that are going to scare us. He's calling us to places that are going to make us nervous. He's calling us to places that are going to challenge us. He's calling us to reach people that don't look like us, sound like us, smell like us. He's calling us to reach this city. He's calling us to reach the hospitals. He's calling us to reach the schools. He's calling us to reach downtown. He's calling us to reach this city. But we got to wake up and we got to stay awake if we're going to be awake through that breakthrough. Everybody stand to your feet with me tonight. If I could have our prayer team come down. I'm going to give two altar calls, no pressure to come down at all. I don't want to give any pressure. But I'm going to open up these altars for two types of people. Number one, you've never had Jesus wake you up before. You've never been woken up out of the sleep that you're in right now. You, you don't know, know what it's like. You've never met Jesus. The guy I'm talking about is foreign to you. You have no idea who he is. I can tell you this much, he will change your life, like I've said tonight. He has mercy. He has grace. He doesn't care about your yesterday because he sees your tomorrow. He's going to change your life. That's Jesus, okay? If that's you, if you fit in that category, you just want Jesus tonight. You just want to be woken up for the first time ever. You want to meet Jesus. I want you to come down to the altar when I tell you and meet with one of our prayer partners here in the front. They're going to help lead you to this guy named Jesus I've been preaching about, our Heavenly Father. Now the other group, maybe you've been woken up before. Maybe you've had Jesus wake you up before, but, but right now you're feeling almost dead. But you know you're not dead because Jesus has spoken to you that you're not dead. He's telling you you need to wake up. If you're one of the ones who you know you need to wake up. Jesus is challenging you and you want Jesus to wake you up again tonight. That altar call is going to be for you. And let me warn you, we've been asleep far too long. See, before we know it, that sleep turns into a slumber. See, a slumber is a bit of a deeper sleep than just a sleep. That sleep will turn into a slumber. Pretty soon, that slumber will turn into a hibernation. And if you know anything about spiritual hibernation, you sleep through whole seasons of life, okay? Spiritual hibernation chokes out, absolutely chokes out spiritual transformation. No more hibernating. We're not even going to get to that stage. You've been awake before, but you need Jesus to wake you up because you know he's calling you tonight. The second group, I want you to come down. You're all going to come down at once. I want, this is not planned, and the guys that I'm going to bring up here have no idea. But there are two other pastors in the room, two who happen to be fathers. And if you're one of the ones who needs to be woken up, you know Jesus, but you know you've been asleep on him and you need to wake up, they're going to pray for you, if you would. Pastor Kevin, Dad, if you would. Because I believe there's something special about the hand of even a heavenly father praying for somebody as they're the head of their household, God has given them some authority. I know that he has. Not just because they're pastors, but because they're fathers. And they're going to pray over you tonight. If I could have both groups 
come. If that's you, come. Get to these altars. If you're in any one of those categories, get to the altars. Find somebody to pray with you. These two are going to be praying over our people who need to wake up again. And if you need to wake up for the first time, find a prayer partner. Jesus is waking us up tonight. Jesus is waking us up tonight. Jesus is waking us up tonight. My generation is not dead. We're just asleep and Jesus is waking us up. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. God, I thank you that you have given us a hope. I thank you that you have given hopeless people a hope that they can hang on to. God, I thank that you have given ruthless people somebody that they can cling to. I thank you for giving lost people an opportunity to find and to find you and to find life. Thank you for your mercy and for your grace. Thank you for giving us a chance. God, even when we end up sleeping on you, even when we end up sleeping on your call sometimes, even when we stay asleep too long sometimes, even when we miss what you have for us, you're a God who says we are not dead. We are not dead. We are not dead because Jesus is alive. Because Jesus is constant. Jesus is forever. Jesus is always. And Jesus can wake us up. God, we thank you for who you are. Thank you for sending your son. Thank you for giving my generation a place we can come and worship you. Thank you for caring enough about my generation to send us Jesus. Thank you, God, for bringing us together again. God, I pray that we would stay awake this year. I pray that we would stay awake through all the times you want to speak to us, through all the times you want to direct us and guide us as you give us every piece of that puzzle, as you put things into place that we can't even plan ourselves. Help us to stay awake because you are calling us. You are calling us tonight. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. Thank you, God, for sending your son. Thank you, Jesus.